Yo, today I wanted to share a few things with you guys I wish I had known from the start when I began my journey in Octane with Cinema 4D. So right off the bat I wanted to talk about the camera itself, especially if you want to shoot character portraits. When you get your Octane camera and you position your camera to get a portrait shot like you see right here, this is what you get. So it's not really flattering. It's super squished in. It almost has this fisheye type look to it that isn't very appealing. There's one quick fix for this. When you get your camera in, the default focal length will always be at 36 millimeters, which is a very narrow. When you click on your camera, you want to go to the object tag and just take a look at your focal length. That's 36. As we change this, the focal length of our piece changes. There's one simple trick to get way better looking portraits that you might have overlooked in the beginning when you started out with Octane. I want to copy this camera by holding Control and just dragging it and then activate this. And let's go to another extreme. So instead of 36, which is a very narrow angle, let's go to like 120 which is a very wide angle and then we just pull back out and all of a sudden you have a way better looking portrait because there's no deformation going on everything is being very flattened and it just looks miles better so if we enable the AB comparison and store our render buffer and go into the other camera then you can see by dragging this that we get a way better look of the face in general. And that is exactly what we want. So, what I want to talk about now is... Sometimes you get a problem with HDRIs. They seem to be way too overexposed for some reason. And it kind of took me a while to find out what I was doing wrong some of the time. So, when you want to get an Octane Sky in, you obviously either click the Octane Sky symbol or just hit Shift C and type Octane Sky. Oh, never mind. You type HDRI, of course. You type HDRI and you get your Octane Sky object in, which is looking like this. You then obviously, you got your HDRI and then you click to search for a texture. In this example, let's pick Swedish rocks and it's hitting you with all this incredible color and just pure white and you don't know what's going on. So you fumble around and you turn off the power, but it doesn't it doesn't seem to be working. It's way too overexposed. And then you might you might find an HDRI that works better. So, for example, if I go into something, something else, if I go into something like this, that's not as bad, right? So why was the first one this screwed up? The problem lies in the fact on how you apply an HDRI. So when you get an Octane Sky in, it gives you this right here. And what you want to do is click on the image texture and not on the browse button. So you want to click inside the rectangle and then you want to browse. So let's take the same HDRI that we just put in there the first time and see what happens. Voila, you get a normal looking HDRI that works just fine. And it's the same thing that overexposed our image so much. Now, some of the time you may still get HDRIs that have way too much bright color information and Octane just doesn't bode well with them. But for the most time when you encounter overexposure like this, you probably didn't put it in an image texture. So what you want to do is if you don't do it like this from the beginning, you can also just tap the little arrow, go to your Octane, go to your image texture, and then you pipe it in. Easy as that. The second thing is depth of field. So depth of field in Octane is super easy. So let me just show you what's going on. We want to zoom in a bit and let me rotate the HDRI around so we get a brighter look at the front. Now, let's say we want to 
reel in the focus on the eye. You got your focus picker up here in the live viewer. So you want to click this and you want to click your eye. Sometimes it'll give you a geometry prompt if something else is in the way and then you can select the geometry that you want to focus on. Now, I have the eye selected and what I want to make sure now is that the focus picker is off because whenever I click somewhere in the render uh, live viewer, the focus gets shifted. So we want to click on our eye and we want to get rid of the focus. Now, what happened, you might ask? Easy, just click on your camera, Octane camera tag, go into thin lens and under depth of field, you can see this right here. So, you can see the focal depth is at 64 centimeters. Nice. That's our eye. So, if we were to select the ear, for example, it's at 72. But, let's just stick to the eye, make sure focus isn't ticked, and then we can crank up our aperture. Like this. And you can already see all this being blurred. So, I can crank it even way, way more. And you get some nice, easy depth of field going. Of course, this might consume way more render resources, but it'll get a nice look going. Then you can, of course, play with your aspect ratio. This one, stretching it horizontally. To the right, stretching it vertically. You can play with the edge, which means when and where the depth of field will start or end. And yeah, everything else is basically just playing around, seeing what works and what doesn't. You can get some really nice looks going with this. Easy as that. Just make sure you pick and focus object and then you can go to town with your depth of field options. The next thing I want to show you is a little trick about glass and octane. Sometimes you might not get the result that you are looking for. Or you might get some real warped objects inside of your glass object. So, so let's say we want to bring that sphere in. And we want to make that sphere be a glass object surrounding our car. So what you would normally do is create a specular material. And just drag it onto your sphere. Now, you got something looking like this. Maybe you even got something looking like this. Which... No bueno. So for glass, we want to make sure that we are in path tracing. Or if you want to work in direct lighting, you want to make sure that your specular depth is at like 16. So more lights get uh, more light gets let through. But we will work in path tracing with this. This is what regular specular looks like. First thing we want to do is go into your material and Tick fake shadows under the comment tab. Now, we got something that looks way more like glass. But the reflection inside is a little bit wobbly and huge around the edge, which isn't really optimal for some use cases at least. So, what we want to do is first, we want to make sure that we get the right index of refraction going, which would be 1.5 for glass. Okay get even more of a distortion going on but still nothing that i'm happy with to be honest what i want to do is i'll hit shift c and type in cloth surface in that cloth surface tab i want to make the subdivision zero and then i'll drag our sphere into the cloth surface like so you might have noticed that nothing has changed well, that is because in the cloth surface object, we want to get a thickness of 0.1. Wow, would you look at that? We got our object encased by glass and the reflections aren't as wobbly. That is because it's not just a thin wall of glass surrounding our objects, but an actual glass dome now with a thickness of 0.1 centimeters. I could crank this up to like one centimeter. Not a big deal because of the scene scale that we're working in. But usually 0.1 works just fine to get way more decent reflections. And then we can of course work more on our glass material, crank up the roughness a bit or get a roughness map going so we can only see a little bit of detail there. 
For example, we could just drag in a regular image texture and then we go to wherever your roughness textures might be saved. In this case, the go-to would be the Travis Davis one. Let's go into streaks and just take a look at this, like this into our roughness. And then we immediate, immediately have something that resembles glass a bit more. Now we can transform them, make them smaller and kind of turn down the power so we get some smudging going on the glass. Now comparing this to something that looks like this. Uh, I think you'll know which one looks better. So fake shadows, cloth surface, and you're pretty much set. For the last tip, I want to take a look at octane lights. We got a we got a scene that is super dark. And let's say we want to animate this with some lights. So we got some nice looking lights. They look nicer than usual. And we want to make them flicker. Like this, for example. Those lights are flickering. They are flickering away. They're flickering like hell. So how can we achieve that with just an area light? Well, that's pretty easy. Now let's get rid of our area light. And now we got a dark scene. Great. So let's get in a new area light. And we want to just rotate this so it faces our ball. Okay, fine. Easy. And sometimes you notice that your live viewer might go dark as soon as you put an octane light in. That's because under display options, you want to make sure that quick shading is ticked so all the objects have their corresponding color no matter the lighting in your scene. Pretty easier to navigate the whole live, uh, the whole render viewer. Um, okay, so now we just got a bland light in here, which is, nah, not really that beautiful to look at so what can we do to make this flicker that's actually super easy so let's head into our light and we go into the node editor and we have our octane light tag right here and what we want to do first is get a where you at get a fall off map in there and plug that into our distribution now we get a fall off on the light itself which immediately gives us way nicer reflections so let's angle it a bit more to the top so we can see what type of reflection we got going on. Something like this, maybe even closer. And you see that it's kind of dissipating around the corner right here, which is a very nice look on its own. So let me just hide the light by cranking down the opacity slider and then what we want to do is head back into our node editor and we want to get a gradient going. So we'll go to our, where are you? Octane gradient, there you are. Get a gradient in and then we want to get a random color node in. Okay, now we plug that random color node into our gradient and the gradient into our texture. Let's head into the gradient and then we'll get like a mm, bunch of points in here. And we'll change values from black to white to gray all over the place to white again. And then to a dark gray, to a bit brighter gray, to a white again, to a brighter gray again. And then we'll just pull those sliders to some degree so we can get a bit harsher cutoff going and as you might have seen in the viewport or the live viewer nothing really changed that much let's go into our random color and go to the beginning of our scene get a keyframe right here at the seed and then let's move to our 90th keyframe and put like 420 69 in okay make another keyframe so now when you slide through your timeline, you can get this nice flickery light going without having to do Espresso, without having to do anything else. 
super nice for ceiling lights, all that stuff. So you can control that just by how many keyframes you want to place in your random seats. Now, for 2069 is a lot. So if I go like 20, you can see that it's kind of flickering, not as much because there's not that many keyframes between the beginning and the end of the scene. And what our random color node is doing, it's grabbing all these values from our gradient and applying them to the texture of the light itself. Meaning that it'll switch through all these different gray tones. Now, if we want to colorize some of them. That's also doable. So let's get a green, let's get a purple, let's get a red, and let's get a let's get a blue between all these grays and whites and blacks. So I'll get a bigger keyframe at like 100,000 or 10,000 at the end of the scene and I'll switch through. And then you can see it'll switch through all these different values that we have applied in our octane gradient. And it's easy as that to just create a flickering light within octane using regular area lights. No plugins, no espresso, just a few nodes and you're set. And what if you want to just illuminate the ball itself, the chrome ball, and leave the light out of the ground? Like, don't illuminate the ground at all. What can you do? Well, Octane makes it pretty easy to exclude light sources from whatever objects you may desire, except for fog volumes, unfortunately, which is a bummer. At least I haven't figured it out yet, how to do something like this. But let's say... We want to get rid of the light on the ground. So we want to assign an octane object tag to our ground plane. And we want to look at our light by clicking on the light tag. And we want to see all the way at the bottom what light ID this is. So let's say you already have a few more lights in the scene and you have one more light that you want excluded from something else. So you want to make sure that that light is a different light tag or light pass ID than the other lights in your scene that you want to have just in normally. Let's assign, let's say, 5. That light has now the light pass ID of 5. And we can go into the octane object tag we just assigned and click an object layer and then use light pass mark. We want to enable this. And as you know, we've just assigned the octane light pass of 5 to our octane light. So we want to uncheck the 5 and we want to take a look at the render viewer. And as you can see, there's no light going from the ground. Like the only light that's appearing on the ground is the bounce light from our ball at the bottom right here. So if we enable this, we have our light illuminating the ground, which we don't want for whatever reason so by just making sure to assign an octane object tag and then use the light pass mark and unchecking whatever light pass id you want to have be invisible easy as that and you're gone you just have the light on the sphere and whatever might be bouncing off the sphere to its surroundings easy clap thank you for watching i hope that you can take away some of this as helpful and incorporate this into your own work this won't be my last video like this i just thought i'd give you a few quick bits of information that i've gathered here and there so yeah if you enjoyed the content thank you for supporting i also have a patreon setup where i share process videos behind the scenes commentary full episodes of my copycat series with commentary project files for learning and so on and so on the link is in the description Thank you very much for watching and hey, you can always leave us suggestions at things you want to see me tackle in the future. No doubt about it. I'll look at each and every one of them. Thank you so much and well, I hope that your 2022 will be better than your 2021 and if your 2021 was already great, which it probably wasn't for most people, I hope 2022 will knock it out of the park in a positive way of course thank you for watching and see you next time or rather next year